Another lovely autumn day. I have some quaking aspen at my place. Five of them, are in a, they grow in an arch. They're about 50 feet tall. So today they're all quaking. <laughs> Golden and yellow and quaking and blowing in the wind. That was quite nice. I'm a, a big fan of falling leaves. <laughs> so we have some good colors this year. They're a little more vibrant, I think. Some years are kind of brownish, slightly bland, but we've got some vivid burnt oranges and yellows and golds and many tones. That was quite nice. It's fun just moving around town and looking at it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eugene's got a nice urban urban forest. You know, you can do better, but it's a good one. Yeah. Well, let's start with the Dalai Lama's longer version. The Blessed Mother, the heart of the perfection of wisdom. Sanskrit, Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Radeya. Thus have I once heard. The Blessed One was staying at Rajgara, at Vulture Peak, along with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. And at that time, the Blessed One entered the meditative absorption on the varieties of phenomena called the appearance of the profound. At that time as well, the noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, clearly beheld the practice of the profound perfection of wisdom itself and saw that even the five aggregates are empty of intrinsic existence. Thereupon, through the Buddha's inspiration, the Venerable Shariputra spoke to the noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, and said, How should any noble son or noble daughter who wishes to engage in the practice of the profound perfection of wisdom train? Indeed. So, does everyone have a copy? We're going to go ahead and recite the Heart Sutra. I have extra copies here. Make sure everybody has one or a booklet. Yeah, nice. Okay, wonderful. Heart of Great Perfect Wisdom Sutra. Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva When deeply practicing Prajnaparamita Clearly saw that all five aggregates are empty And thus relieved all suffering Shariputra form does not differ from emptiness Emptiness does not differ from form. Form itself is emptiness. Emptiness itself form. Sensations, perceptions, formations, and consciousness are also like this. Shariputra, all dharmas are marked by emptiness. They neither arise nor cease, are neither defiled nor pure neither increase nor decrease. Therefore, given emptiness, there are no forms, sensations, perceptions, formations, or consciousness, no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind, no sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, or objects of mind, no realm of sight, and so forth, down to no realm of mind consciousness. There is neither ignorance, nor extinction of ignorance, and so forth, down to neither old age and death, nor extinction of old age and death. No suffering, no cause, no cessation, no path, no knowledge, and no attainment. 
with, with nothing to attain, a bodhisattva relies on prajna paramita, and thus the mind is without hindrance, without hindrance, there is no fear, far beyond all inverted views, one realizes nirvana, all Buddhas of past, present and future rely on prajna paramita, and thereby attain unsurpassed, complete, and perfect enlightenment. Therefore, know the prajna paramita as the great miraculous mantra, the great bright mantra, the supreme mantra, the incomparable mantra, which removes all suffering and is true, not false. Therefore, we proclaim the Prajna Paramita Mantra, the mantra that says, Gakte Gakte Paragakte Parasam Gakte Bodhisattva. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so folks have been here. This is the third class, so we don't need to go over too much of what we've already covered. Not a lot of new faces. Um. Hmm. Yeah. Actually, I was thinking about uh, wheels. They're quite interesting wheels, but n not mechanical wheels. So. You know, the Native Americans of this whole continent, they didn't have a wheel. They had no mechanical wheel until the Europeans got here. But they had medicine wheels. They had these stone wheels with mandalas. They used them for ceremonies and uh, solstice and equinox and so forth. They're quite interesting. Um, also, you know, the Tibetans do sand paintings. You know, a lot of you are familiar with that. They do these sand paintings and they have different colored pigments and ground up rocks and minerals and such. And they do a ceremony and they'll do these, they're not actual, like painting paint, but granular materials. And uh, they travel around the world, they'll do a ceremony or ritual. They've done them in Eugene before. And you know, they could be four or five, eight feet in diameter. They're on the ground on a flat surface. And so they make these intricate mandalas and a mandala is Sanskrit for circle, but not just any circle, it's a sacred circle. Now what's fascinating to me is not only that they do that, but the Navajo Indians also do it. And they have no physical contact ever uh, that we know of, right? So for centuries, the Navajo Indians in Arizona would create these sand paintings and then uh, the shamans and then someone that was sick, they would place them within there. And there's a cer ceremony and ritual. So they had these sacred uh, sand paintings, and the Tibetans have them with no connection. Now there's no one more part to this little story, and that's the great Swiss psychologist Jung studied many, many, many patients, and he found that a uh, number of people that were m mentally imbalanced, what have you, had some issues, and children also made mandalas. They had little drawings. And so there's part of the human psyche uh, attempting to be whole that is creating these things. And anyway, Buddhism is connected with that. I thought I'd share that little bit of stuff. Because I'm in, very interested in art, and all this is related to art. All, all these are creating visual images that all of us do. Humans all over the world do this. So that's one aspect of art that's very fascinating. That's for healing.
So uh, Edward Kahn's was a, a scholar, a renowned scholar that uh, devoted most of his life to uh, translating uh, the Prajnaparamita literature, perfection of wisdom literature. He was a German scholar, and uh, he produced the Diamond Sutra, the Heart Sutra, uh, uh, Sutra in 8,000 Lines. He, he, he was quite insightful and just devoted his whole life to it. And that really wasn't his background, but he, he was attracted to it. He said he was reincarnated. He wasn't even a Buddhist. He didn't meditate. But he was quite a scholar, and so he devoted his life to, to the, the Prajnaparamita literature. And so in a little text I have, uh, his translation of the Diamond Sutra and the Heart Sutra, there's a foreword by uh, a woman scholar, and I'm going to read that little bit. It's quite interesting. It says that the Heart Sutra remains a litmus test for the limits of my conceptual mind. Its daily repetition engenders confidence in dwelling in the groundless radiance of things as they really are. So that's uh, uh, Judith Simmer Brown for the, the preface to Kant's work. And so she, you know, she's quite insightful. And so there she is sharing that she, she just recites it every day. You know? uh, and so for all that are interested, I highly recommend that you do that. You know, if you you can memorize it, great. If not, read it. It's fine. Uh, it's 300 words, roughly. And so, uh, yeah, I do recite it early in the morning, as I had mentioned before. So reflecting back on uh, Avalokiteshvara, you know, this wonderful cave painting, uh, the great Bodhisattva. Uh, and uh, I had mentioned last week the six paramitas of a Bodhisattva. So that's key, that's old, that's ancient Buddhism, uh, the, six par the six perfections. Or, you know, again, you know, we're not trying to be perfect. It's, you're cultivating and nourishing and nurturing uh, these six practices. Uh, and in itself, it's a bit of a mandala because what's key to the six paramitas is prajna uh, uh, or shunyata, the perfection of wisdom. And so for each paramita, prajna also informs all of the other paramitas. And that's key to the perfection of wisdom sutras is prajna. And the heart sutra, it's central. Yes. Again, the uh, six paramitas, generosity, or dana, ethics, sila, forbearance, or patience, kashanti, ajo named my car, kashanti. My car might be patient, but I'm not. So I'm working on it. <laughs> so, he knows I needed help. Vigor, uh, virya, uh, meditation or dhyana or samadhi and wisdom or prajna, the six perfections of a bodhisattva. So that's, that's central to Buddhist practice, you know, bodhisattva being all, all of us, you know, that want to practice Buddhism, but that's key, uh, uh, classic Buddhism, uh, not just Zen, or Soto Zen or Zen, but classic Buddhism. And so as you go to study Buddhism, wherever they'll have the paramitas. Sometimes ten, but the, the six, I think, were the, the, the original six uh, perfections of wisdom. Mm. So just a little background. So 
So key to uh, the Heart Sutra, again, is compassion, compassion and wisdom. Uh, always the two wings. And so, fortunately in our society, there is quite a bit of compassion. Uh, it, it, it helps it function. You know, even throughout Eugene, there's all sorts of great organizations. Food for Lane County, you know, Eugene Mission, they house people, they feed people, and the list goes on. Um, people volunteering and so forth and so on. So, you know, compassion is, is very immediate. Uh, however, we could use more of it. Uh, I, I, I consider it more of a, a universal force, at, potentially, that humans are tapping into. And of course, the Dalai Lama, that's central to his, his whole existence, practice, and teaching, uh, is compassion. Uh, 1971, uh, Ram Das wrote, Be Here Now. Anyone familiar here with Ram Das? Yeah, yeah, well-known person. Anyway, this is the 50th anniversary of Be Here Now. And uh, I happen to have read that in around 1973. Someone handed me a copy of it. So it was very influential. And he was a great, he died recently, maybe a couple of years ago. But he was a great American spiritual teacher. Uh, uh, when all was said and done, died about nearly 90 years old. But he was a dynamic force for working in the prisons, working with the dying early on before many people were doing it. Uh, uh, helped co-found the Seva Foundation, which was an international organization that brings sight to people that have a, a simple operation, but they're blind. And so Seva is throughout the world you know, doing these op operations that bring sight back. So he was instrumental in all of this. Uh, uh, quite amazing. So kind of like the uh, Thich Nhat Hanh engaged, you know, engaged Buddhism. Uh, uh, Ram Das wasn't necessarily a Buddhist, but he loved Buddhism. But he was very engaged. And compassion, he wrote a piece on compassion that I find interesting, provocative. So I will read it. What is compassion? Compassion is a quality of being in relationship to others and the intensity of their lives. It's an appreciation of their lives. The way we usually use it, compassion has to do with the suffering of others and kindness and gentleness and empathy and going outward to another person. But it's actually more profound spirit, uh, a more profound spiritual issue than that. I've been working for a long time with the phrase, out of emptiness arises compassion. And of course, we're working with emptiness extensively with the Heart Sutra. Because most of the time, when we think of compassion, we think of empathy. We think of seeing suffering, and then we want to do something about it. We are concerned and feel for the other person's suffering. But the compassion that one looks at from a spiritual point of view, is the kind in which those qualities are balanced with an appreciation of the planes of reality that lie behind what is apparent or obvious. So compassion involves a certain kind of attention or a certain kind of a paradox. For example, when you respond from your human heart's point of view to another person's suffering, when you see a Guatemalan widow or see a family lost in crack or the Chinese students in front of a tank or what happened to the people around Chernobyl or something like that, you experience incredible pain in your heart when your heart is open. Many people just respond with their intellect when they get in the presence of suffering. They can't handle it. So they pull back into their minds and they deal with it intellectually. But if you keep your heart open, it hurts. It really hurts when you can't intellectually push them away, especially when you've started to appreciate that they are us and not them. But there is another level of reality, and this is a much harder one for people to hear, in which there is an unfolding of karma for those individuals in which their suffering 
is their route through to awakening, long-term though it may be. And in that sense, you look at the universe as a set of unfolding laws. You see that there are no errors on that plane. You see the perfection of it, so that you're faced with the paradox that, on one level, reality, the suffering stinks, but on the other level, it's perfect. To me, compassion is the ability to embrace both of those simultaneously. Well, it's quite a statement. Yeah, that's from Das. It's a little booklet that just came out not long ago. Cookbook for Awakening. Core teachings from Ram Das. Yeah. It's be quite interesting. So, the complexity of compassion and the necessity. He pushes the edge there with that one. Uh, quite well. So as we're moving along, exploring this uh, fascinating sutra, Shariputra, form does not differ from emptiness. Emptiness does not differ from form. Form itself is emptiness, and emptiness itself form. So that's considered the most famous Buddhist <laughs> saying uh, by some, by many. Uh, form itself is emptiness, and emptiness itself form. So where are we going with that? Um, Again, uh, emptiness is not nothingness, which where our language is a little awkward, but we've been talking about this, so we know that that's not, not what it's about. And uh, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, again, uh, interbeing, you know, his, his, his word for that is interbeing, interbeing. We are, inter, we inter are. Uh, rather than things being empty, we have a complex uh, dynamic relationship with everything. So in a Buddhist sense, there is no uh, absolute and separate self. In a conventional sense, there is. We're all here, we have names, we have bodies. And, uh, and we know that, and that's quite true. Uh, uh, but we tend as a, a species to get trapped in that and thus on the extreme level the conflict of the world. Uh, you know, it's us and them and there's so many reasons why and we define it and, and defend, <laughs> defend our border and our ideas to extreme sense and you know, the spiritual teachings are saying no, we can do better than that because that's not who we are anyway. <laughs> You know, that's basically in the realm of delusion uh, is where that's coming from. And, and so that, that is something very important uh, to explore. Uh-huh. Samsara, sometimes it's spelled S-A-N, Samsara. So Samsara, uh, that's, 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 that's key you know, in Buddhism, Samsara, uh, the realm of Samsara, that's cyclic existence uh, from birth to death to birth to death to birth to death. But Samsara is, is the realm of suffering. It's, it's the unawakened uh, life. And the work and the practice of Buddhism is to wake up so that we are not perpetuating a samsaric existence. 
And the Heart Sutra has core teachings addressing uh, samsara, uh, very much so. Hmm. Form itself is emptiness. Emptiness itself form. Sensations, perceptions, formations, and consciousness are also like this. Shariputra, all dharmas are marked by emptiness. They neither arise nor cease, are neither defiled nor pure, neither increase nor decrease. Oh, yeah, really. Mm -hmm. So all dharmas, all phenomena, all known phenomena. So as Avalokiteshvara is going down this list um, of the Sarvastivadins and the Abhidharma. So basically a lot of early Buddhism was, there were different factions of it, right? So this teaching really is addressing that. Uh, because some of them branched off and they were really focused on the beginning part of the Heart Sutra, which is all phenomena, your hearing, your eyes, and you know, that's the foundation of reality as we see it as human beings. And th these are dharmas, but it's all phenomena are dharmas. Uh, not to be confused with dharma, the capital D, and the wheel of teaching. So all dharmas, all phenomena. And Avalokiteshvara is bringing this teaching of the light of Prajnaparamita uh, to Shariputra, who, you know, is a wise person, but it's pretty much the core is the Four Noble Truths. There is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there is the cessation of suffering as their path. So the Abhidhamis are bringing in just your body, all phenomena, and, and thus suffering. And where Avalokiteshvara is going is there's another dimension that we need to explore. And, and that's where he starts beginning with this teaching. Uh, going down the list of the dharmas, And it's interesting here, you know, they neither arise nor do they cease. They are neither defiled nor are they pure. They don't increase and they don't decrease. <laughs> so that's uh, what's going on, uh, one, one must ask, you know, what, what's going on here? Um, uh, the, the normal rational mind. And so basically... The whole Abhidharma is based in what's called jhana, which is knowledge and reason, which we have, and it's very useful. That, of course, that's how we function. But he's saying there's another dimension uh, that we can explore of, of the Buddhist teachings that brings a different light uh, to what we call reality. So continuously it comes up that there is no separate, permanent, or abiding self. No intrinsic self. There's a conventional self, but ultimately uh, there is not. And so here we have a mudra that you'll see people walking around here. Usually if you're at a monastery or, or in the temple, the people that are training, they, have, they hold their hand like this, and this is a... So, shashu, the mudra of no self. So that's just a reminder. That that's a mudra. That's a that's a physical expression 
just like sitting, sitting in lotus is a mudra. There's different mudras. So this mudra is the mudra of no self. And so, uh, generally speaking, when you're in a monastery, uh, your hands are in a particular position, and this is one of them. If you're walking around or sitting, your hands are like this. And that is just another reminder. Uh, it's an expression, a form and expression of no self. So if you see somebody doing that, you know what you're, they're up to. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite nice. Sha Shu, mudra of no self. Actually, during the ceremony here, you know, when we had the installed, Ajo was the abbot. I, I was standing across from the Japanese priest and I was in that mudra, but I had my hands over my raksu, and you're supposed to have them under. I, I knew that, but they saw me and he came over and corrected me. And he was very nice, yeah. but I mean, they were ambassadors, you know, to the form. They were moving around a lot doing that. Yeah, no, I mean, their job was is to, you know, convey their culture. It's a big deal, you know. And so they wanted to make sure things were done. And totally, it's totally fair. And, so, and then he saw me later. He says, you okay? I said, oh, no, there's no problem. You know, it's fine. But the forms are, you know, that's their form. They've developed it over centuries, you know. So they want to you bring it to a new country. And you want, you know, and what we do with it is what we do with it. But you want to convey it correctly so that it gets integrated. And then, you know, each culture has their own interpretation which we're in the process of now. Uh, well, it's interesting, you know. We're in a very unique time in the sense that Buddhism has only been in America 100 years. There's a poster out here, and uh, uh, Japanese Buddhism uh, arrived not... What's interesting is, you know, we think of the immigrants coming to America, and most of them, they come through the East, like New York and Ellis Island and so forth and so on. Most of the people here, your relatives, most likely came through that, that gate. Mine did. Uh, but the Japanese actually came from the West. They came from Hawaii and in that way. So historically, we don't really have a re reference to that. It's changing. Uh, 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 but that's the way they came. And so next year, we'll be celebrating the 100th year of uh, Zen Buddhism in America, which began in L.A. Uh, uh, because a lot of it we associate with, for instance, the Beats in the 1950s and Alan Watts, and, and that's all true. But it actually has, the roots are with the Japanese, not the Tibetans, the Tibetans came later. Uh, the Chinese were here, but, uh, and recently I went into a little museum in Portland that uh, uh, is all about the Chinese in Portland for the last 150 years. And they certainly, uh, but they didn't mention anything about Buddhism in that particular display. So I'm curious, I'm going to go back and ask them. I'm sure some were Buddhists, but they kept it under wraps, you know. Uh, uh, but in, in L.A., they actually built a temple. There's a temple there, it's been there now nearly 100 years. And so Japanese Buddhism came from the West, which Gary Snyder likes to talk about, the Pacific Rim culture. That we're more, we're more connected with the Pacific Rim culture than we are with the East Coast of America, uh, in, in certain senses. Uh, uh, that's very much a part of this, this whole West. The trade that happened over the years, and culturally, the Hawaiians, the Japanese, and so forth and so on. And so uh, it's an interesting perspective. So, uh, yeah, so we're about to celebrate 100 years of Zen in America, in LA. I'll be going. So this contingent and what was happening here was very much connected to, to all, of what I, all of that, very much so. And even so even Suzuki Roshi, who came here you know, to San Francisco in the 50s. Well, there, there was people here before him some, you know, 30 years that we didn't, haven't heard much about. Um, but we will, as that's, there's more books being written and, and so forth and so on. So it's another important part of American history that 
uh, we don't really know much about because we were never educated that way. So the five skandhas, the five aggregates, we mention that just once again. Uh, that's key in Buddhism, and that's a that's a Buddhist teaching. So one would examine closely, you know, the reality of of your senses. Your hearing's you know really important. Your sight, sense of smell, how that relates. We burn incense. We have candles. We're engaging. We're engaging the senses. Uh, so one way of looking at Form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. Uh, from a Zen perspective, is it's a koan, right? A koan being, you know, it's a spiritual teaching that at face value it seems contradictory or paradoxical, but there's a teaching that lies within it. So I, that's a nice way of looking at form is emptiness, emptiness is form. It's, it's a koan. Okay. We will, we will look into the matter. And Red, Red Pine is one of the texts I've been working with. Great scholar in Port Townsend. American, had spent time in a monastery in Taiwan, and he, he, he's a scholar of Chinese and Sanskrit, you know, very, very renowned. Uh, and he's done the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, a number of books on Zen, Chinese uh, Zen, Chan, uh, quite interesting. Uh, and so here, um, within his text, there's a lot of commentaries written on the Heart Sutra, thousands actually. That's what, that's what you know, a lot of monastics do. They have a bit of time and so they'll study the sutras and then you know, once you're skilled, if you write, you're gonna write a commentary. And so within his text, he has a number of commentaries written by uh, Chinese priests or Sanskrit and so forth and so on. So he includes those and it spices it up. Uh, it's quite nice. So this, this is a little bit of a commentary uh, by uh, Chen Kyo. Chen Kyo says, ordinary people don't understand. They see form, but they don't see emptiness. Followers of the two paths are biased and see emptiness, but they don't see form. It is just like the water of the Ganges. Fishes and dragons see it as a cavernous home. Devas see it as an aquamarine. Humans see it as a flowing current. Hungry ghosts see it as a roaring blaze. What these four beings see is nothing but their emotions. Those who wake up understand that none of these exist. <laughs> Another koan. We're not saying that things don't exist, but he's coming at it from a different direction. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, we move along in the sutra. Therefore, given emptiness, there are no forms, sensations, perceptions, formations, or consciousness. There's no eye, no ear, no nose, no body, no tongue, no mind, no sight, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no objects of mind, no realm of sight, and so forth, down to no realm of mind consciousness. So all the skandhas, uh, the aggregates, the 12 abodes, 
the 18 elements, these are all part of Buddhism. Uh, Avalokiteshvara is saying they're all empty. Uh, and so, Guruji? yes. Uh, yesterday, I mean last week, uh, when you were explaining uh, the uh, skyless form yeah. uh, perception, it's kind of helpful <clears throat> because uh, I think sometimes with a text like this, which is almost like the pinnacle of Mahayana Buddhism, yeah, uh, it's helpful to see what it's branching off from mm -hmm. and uh, so I thought I was very helpful because uh, when when we're talking about the sixth sense base right I, I don't have any problem with that <laughs> yeah it's just pretty it's pretty obvious you know eyes ears yeah nose, sure kind of yeah. Body. I got all that yeah, yeah. but mm -hmm. sometimes I start overanalyzing the meaning of words yeah mm -hmm. and so when you were pointing out the uh, form is uh, you know uh, you were saying the form is basically matter. All form, yeah. With, all matter. They say form, but it's basically matter. The, the, so and, and then and but sometimes I I'll overanalyze. I almost want to get a dictionary out. Mm -hmm. The difference between sensation and perception. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's I <clears throat> for some reason like the, the you know the sixth sense base. I'm walking around with that. But when I get in, when I start analyzing the actually the meaning of the words mm -hmm. of uh, you know forms, uh, uh, particularly sensation and perception. Yeah. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, formation. Uh, the way uh, Red Pine will use, will actually use the word memory. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes you'll hear uh, uh, mental formations as kind of. Uh, you know, volitional attitudes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you, you, different approaches, uh, maybe different words explaining the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then consciousness, you know, is this awareness of all the aggregates. That's right. The mind, yeah. You know, uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, you know, so sometimes I just, I'm, I'm you know, when you, were, when you were going back over, you were saying something like, uh, you know, Forms matter, uh, 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 per, uh, perception was a uh, uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes I think those, you know, kind of, you know, brass tack nailing it down a little bit yeah. is, re is really helpful because uh, you, uh, you, can, you, know, you step off from home plate <laughs> and start, you know, going around the baseball field. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, yeah, because yeah. I, I, I have a tendency to overanalyze, and then, mm. and not to mention, you know, a 12 link chain of dependent origination. I want somebody to like write a Jack <laughs> and Jill storybook. <laughs> you know, I, I was told, I was, Why not? I, I was asking AJ to do a, a children's book uh -huh. of, of, you know, uh, Jack and Jill and a dog named Tip, you know, yeah, and just uh, have like 12 houses in the neighborhood. Yeah. And, and go through the 12 link chain of dependent origination and kind of uh, put that into the context of life, you know. Uh, uh -huh. how, uh, Get it grounded. How, how do you, you know, how, yeah. how, how, uh, how is that ex an example of, a, a, of, you know, a delusion which, you know, in the 12 link chain of dependent origination almost sounds like uh, Darth Vader or something, you know, it's just like this. <laughs> This delusion, you know. Yeah. This dark delusion, you know. Okay. Anyway, I don't, I don't want you to go there. I'm just, but I, I'm just, uh, it was, I, it was, uh, it's helpful sometimes to, uh, when you, uh, to narrow, narrow down those, uh, uh, you know, uh, Abhidharma Pali yeah. terminology. Yeah. You know, mm. And and then, because that's what that's what this is actually taking the next step from. Yeah, and well, sometimes when you just when you just hit this kind of text, uh, right. you know, grain, you know, so to speak, you know, it's uh, uh, it's a bit overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, one of the reasons I read the piece by Ramdas mm -hmm. is that he grounds, however far out this seems, mm -hmm. he grounds it right in life, 
and, and works with compassion. Very, very tangible, right? Yet there's so much more, but he's grounding it in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, which I really admire. And so does Thich Nhat Hanh, you know? He's, a, he's an activist in the world, uh, but nevertheless, he talks about form and emptiness and interbeing, more, the, part, the more subtle aspect of the teaching. And when I was just, you just opened the gate because where we're going to go next is the 12 links of dependent origination. Oh, okay. You just opened the gate. However, okay, so there is neither ignorance nor extinction of ignorance and so forth down to neither old age and death nor extinction of old age and death. So that's the first and the, and the last link. The Heart Sutra leaves out the ten in the middle because they're implying you already know them. So we're, we're, there's no need to be repetitive, even though the first part here with the Abhidharma is very repetitive. So we get to the twelve links, which is a key Buddhist teaching. It's a very important Buddhist teaching. The twelve links gets to the root of samsara, that's what samsara is, cyclical suffering. So the 12 links, I will read them, of dependent origination. And what this comes down to is causes and conditions. We are, we are creating our karma, right? The causes and conditions, the, the unfolding of our karma. That's the teaching of the 12 links. So they're analyzing this. So it begins with ignorance, volition, action, Consciousness, name and form, sense sources, contact, feelings, attachment, graspings, becoming, birth, aging, and death. Those are the 12 links. And if you were in a monastic, and there's, we don't examine those so close in, in the Zen school, but Theravadin, maybe, or the Dalai Lama, they're very analytical. Again, uh, it's not a criticism at all. It's, there's different ways of approaching it. They're very analytical and thorough, and, and if one has that, that uh, uh, sensibility, then you, know, you can look into it from that way and, and, and explore it. And it's, it's very useful. So the 12 links, basically, but that's samsaric existence. And within it is the teaching of that there's reincarnation. Is reincarnation uh, of the unawakened mind. So one of the aspects of how we deal with this, not deal with it, but meet it, is that we sit zazen. You know, so before we had this class, we all sat zazen. And there you are with your mind. You know, what you had for dinner and... <laughs> You know, your car's light is broken and it goes on and, on and it's spinning and spinning and spinning, you know, that's, that's what we do. And we're, but we're facing it, you know, that's the beauty of zazen. It's not an abstraction. It's like we sit zazen. And so uh, the, the, medicine, the medicine of meditation is, is that with, it combined with the teachings and with competent teachers, and there are many, you can come and, and explore this in a grounded way uh, to, to unfold, unfold the teaching in the medicine. So another, another big teaching is right here, you know, just a few lines down, it's the 12 links, causes and conditions. So there is neither ignorance nor extinction of ignorance, and so forth down to neither old age and death nor extinction of old age and death. So Avalokiteshvara is saying, there is no ignorance or no age and no age. They're empty. So he's, this is, the, the teaching continues. Well, how could that possibly be? And then it gets even more interesting. There's no suffering. The first turning of the Buddhist wheel in Sarnath is there is suffering. That's the first teaching of the Buddha. There is, there is suffering. There is the cause of suffering. 
There is the cessation of suffering, and there is the path. So this sutra goes on. There is no suffering. There's no cause. There's no cessation. There's no path. There's no knowledge, and there's no attainment. <laughs> right? So a little confounding. Again, it's within the light of the teachings of Prajnaparamita that there's a different unfolding in energy being explored uh, by Avalokiteshvara. Digest that for just a bit. So, causes and conditions, you know, that's central to the 12 links and samsara, karma. And, like at the center of that, are what we call the, the three poisons. Uh, spinning around in, in, in the human condition. Right? And those are greed, hate, and delusion. And that's core Buddhist, that's core Buddhist teaching, classical Buddhist teaching, the three poisons. And sometimes there's, a, there's, a, there's images where there's a snake, a rooster, and a pig in Chinese. And the, the image of Yama, there's a mandala, and there's a cycle of, of life and death. And in the center are the three poisons also known as the defilements. And so the, the medicine of Buddhism is th that we study the teachings, we meditate, and we're more aware of the causes, causes and conditions of our mind, right? So that it empowers us uh, to make more wholesome choices, thoughts, words, and deeds. Uh, a good part of the world is not aware of this at all, and the problems are always out there, somewhere. Someone, somebody is, is creating the issue, right? Um, Buddhism turns that to our own beings and explores what is at the root of that. So the medicine of Buddhism is exploring our own conditions, and they're giving us maps and teachings to, to work our way into this. They've been working on this for 2,500 years uh, with great clarity. Uh, there's, there's different expressions of it. Um, and so that, that's central to this whole teaching is, and the Dalai Lama really works with this a lot, and there's different approaches and teachings, is cleansing the defilements. Like we say that everyone has Buddha nature, and what they're saying is that ultimately uh, the defilements are clouding that. The greed, hate, and delusion, all the complexities. Uh, uh, but if you clarify that, you know, there is Buddha nature, which is what Buddha woke up to. Uh, whereas Buddha had been working with that for some lifetimes, we gather. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's available to everyone. Uh, everyone has the capacity uh, for illumination. There is neither ignorance 
nor extinction of ignorance, and so forth down to neither old age and death, nor extinction of old age and death. There's no suffering, no cause, no cessation, no path, no knowledge, and no attainment. Well, Robert Thurman, he's, I love Robert Thurman, but he says, well, we know what suffering is. Everybody knows that. That's not really a big teaching. You know, cessation is the, that's the one. That's the key. That's the key Buddhist teaching in the Four Noble Truths is cessation. How can we bring cessation to suffering? Of course, you have to be aware of it first and foremost, of course, so that's why it's first. But how can there be cessation? And the medicine of the Buddha, Buddhism says there is. There is cessation. And you have the capacity for that. You don't have to appeal to an abstract uh, god or goddess. You have the capacity as a human being uh, to do that. Neither increasing nor decreasing. The moon is always the moon. Thich Nhat Hanh. We worry because we think that after we die, we will not be a human being anymore. We will go back to being a speck of dust. In other words, we are decreasing. But that is not true. A speck of dust contains the whole universe. If we were as big as the sun, we might look down at the earth and see it as insignificant. As human beings, we look at dust in the same way. But the ideas of big and small are just concepts in our minds. Everything contains everything else. And that is the principle of interdependence and interpenetration. This sheet of paper contains the sunshine, the logger, the forest, everything. So uh, the idea that a sheet of paper is small or insignificant is just an idea. We cannot destroy even one sheet of paper. We are incapable of destroying anything. When they assassinated Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King, they hoped to reduce them into nothingness. But these people continue to be with us perhaps even more than before. Because they continue other forms. We ourselves continue their being. So let us not be afraid of decreasing. It is like the moon. We see the moon increasing and decreasing, but it is always the moon. <laughs> okay. Think not, huh? You know, he just brings it all, you know, it's just so insightful. So you mentioned something about doing a children's book, and he, he, he can approach things that way. He's so gifted, you know, he'll simplify it. Uh, these profound teachings, I can't even come close to doing that. He, he simplifies it. It makes it very tangible and real. It's, oh, wow, okay. He, he, he covers both bases. I remember him saying that he teaches uh, Theravadan Buddhism with a Mahayana spirit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's very in-depth. Which is interesting. Vast. Vietnam was kind of where both those schools actually were overlapping and taking place at the same time. Yeah, they're in that area. Mm-hmm. But Zen had been in Vietnam for a long time. It goes back um, over a thousand years. Yeah. You know, and he's still, he's living at the temple where he started. Where he, where he, where, where, where he, you know, he received the precepts as a 16-year-old. He's, he's there now. He stopped taking any kind of medications? Oh, I don't know. I think he did. He said, he's yeah. done with it. Yeah, I don't and know. He, it was quite a while ago that he did that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Pretty amazing. Oh yeah, old to say the least. Basically a living saint. Yeah. Anyway, we're lucky to have such a being amongst us. So we have a we have a, a meditation uh session coming up in another week or so, first week of November. Uh, uh, Sashin is 
basically touching the mind, you know, uh, session. And so that's what we did uh, this evening, just sitting. You don't have to come and sit for two days, three days, four days, if you have time and interest and the ability, that's nice. Uh, but just a little bit here and there is, you know, that makes a difference. And most people can do that. I mean, a lot of people are super busy, they are working, they have children, any number of circumstances. But, you know, somebody could probably take five minutes and do a little breathing and, you know, watch their breath. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's good. Are there any protocols with uh, the COVID going on right now? I know, like, the sessions in the past, you know, you would just come through the front door a lot of everybody was doing walking meditation, and then when they stopped, and they would all go to their seats, then you would enter at that point and find a cushion. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I don't know right if that's. Well, we'll cl we'll clarify that. Yeah, if that's happening. Yeah, no, no, no. We'll we'll, we'll have that information available. Okay. Because I know that you like to drop in. Yeah. And which is wonderful. I mean, we structured it so. You don't have to participate in the whole thing. You can come in the evenings. You can come in the morning. There's certain times when you check in and check out. Mm -hmm. But it's very flexible to where we want to be very porous and make it available. Okay. That people can experience uh, the meal or the evening chanting. There are a number of opportunities. But with COVID, and it is, things are getting better with COVID. Yeah. Uh, uh, it is decreasing. Yeah. Uh, but we, we still want to be very cautious. So we will we will come up with a new uh, information. Yeah. Okay. And communicate that. I was just wondering because on Sunday they were mentioning you know uh, because of the way things are you know because of the pandemic that uh, things need to be uh, you need to sign up. Yeah. You know, and so I wasn't sure about that. You know, the spontaneous part of just kind of popping in and coming in, you know, meditating for two hours, to, you know, whatever. And then she asked. That's fine. To just sign up. I'm sorry. Only sign up. There won't be any drop-ins. Only sign. Up. Only sign, sign up. ups. Yeah. Okay. But you can sign up for a short period. Okay. Oh, I go. see. So yeah, but go stay go tuned, and we'll. Rather than just kind of show up the meeting at six thirty or whatever. Okay. So okay, so yeah. you can come in for short periods, but you need to sign up for that. Okay, got it. Yeah. So do it if you okay. if you can, if you can okay. muster it. That would be good. Hmm. Okay, so, so at the end we chant the Pali refuges. Oops. Uh, you asked what that was about, and uh, you know that uh, the Theravadan uh, sutras are written in Pali, right? That's an old language that goes way back in, in uh, Sri Lanka. <coughs> Sri Lanka. Um, and so when we chant the refuges, basically what, we're, what you're saying is, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. That's what we're saying when we close in that Pali. And it's just a repetitive, it's three different ways of saying it, and that's why we have three different forms. But that's what that's about. Yeah. You know, there's another Bodhi tree in Sri Lanka. Uh, the Buddha, there's a Bodhi tree in, 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 uh, in northern India, in Bihar, in the state of Bihar. And it's, it's still there. Uh, and people circumambulate around it. But a couple of years or so, a couple hundred years after the Buddha's Paranirvana, there was an emperor, Ashoka, and he was a champion of Buddhism. And, and, and vigorously he was uh, working to transform India to a, a Buddhist culture uh, to a large degree. He had these, it might be the earliest writing, the earliest book, he had edicts carved in stone and placed in different parts of India. That could be the earliest uh, writing actually about Buddhism, uh, the edicts. But his daughter and son took a... Uh, a sapling or a cutting from the Bodhi tree and went to Sri Lanka uh, uh, and brought it there. I went, I went to this tree and circumambulated it. You went to Sri Lanka? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and 
There's one story, I went to a monastery and they have all these painted caves and the young monks said, you know, and they showed me all the pictures and it tells the story. It's several hundred years old because people couldn't read, a lot of people. And it showed the sun had broke, uh, brought the... the, the uh, but then another story, when you get to the actual tree, there's a sculpture of the daughter and you get flowers and make offerings. Mm. And it says that the daughter brought the... A lot of people don't know that. The roots of Buddhism are very, very much um, uh, uh, indebted to, uh, to a young woman <laughs> that brought the Bodhi tree to Sri Lanka. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah that's great. Yeah, and it's growing. It's a beautiful, big thing. And people come there and do a pilgrimage and walk around it. Yeah. There you go. Women in Buddhism, right from the beginning. Buddha This and all our teachings are offered free of charge. If you would like to make a donation, please visit our website at buddhaai.org and click the donate button at the top of the page. Thanks. Sangha.